Okay, so without any further ado, um, so without any further ado, we begin this first round table titled Industrial Policy in the 21st Century. For this first panel, we have wonderful group of practitioners and academics that will lead this discussion for the next uh, minutes. So we have here Professor David Luke, who is professor in practice and a strategic director of uh, the Institute for Africa, the LAC. We have uh, Professor James Nerumpara, head of the Center for Trade and Investment Law and the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. We also have Professor Vera Thurstenson, professor uh, who is the School of Economics at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil and is the head of the Center on Global Trade and Investment. We have Mark Wu, professor at Harvard Law School, and of course, uh, our wonderful partner in this conference, uh, Professor Isabel Van Damme, partner at Van Bell and Bellis. And finally, this, this panel will be moderated by Amy Borges, a partner at Borges Law PLLC. So without any further ado, the time, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to start by, with a little introduction. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, I just want to say that I'm personally very pleased to be here, uh, that this CL Biennial, the very first one in person post pandemic, it's wonderful to see you all here. And for those, you, so those who are watching this online, I wish you were here too. So I want to thank the hosts, I want to thank uh, the Universidad Externado de Colombia and the Universidad del Rosario and the organizi organizers in Colombia and, and the from CL. So as the first event on the program, we're going to be focusing on the topic of the year, industrial policy in the 21st century. So industrial policy has come a long way since the planned economies of the 30s, post-war reconstruction, state-led development 40 to 70 years ago, and it's also come a long way since 1986 when Ronald Reagan said that the nine most terrifying words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So here, here we are in 2023 and the paradigm seems to have shifted. Whether it's a permanent shift, we don't know yet. So we have a, a industrial policy that's new and mixed, a mix of new and old policies. The new industrial policy, I think, came really started up most immediately from the pandemic experience when you know globalized supply chains turned out to be unreliable governments mobilized the private sector to create and scale up vaccines and medicines and distribute medicines and government basically the government became a player in the market and meanwhile there was there has been this existing background of increased tension with china starting with Trump, intensified by the pandemic isolation between China and the rest of the world. And in the background, a longstanding active industrial policy in China and concerns elsewhere with competition with China. So the, uh, the industrial policy of the last two years starts with these concerns. And you add in also the disruption caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine security uncertainty in East Asia, a new focus on climate transition, clean energy, and the energy industries of the future. We'll hear about all this from our great opening roundtable panelists, who are very well equipped to talk about these issues from all kinds of perspectives around the world. And they are seated in alphabetical order, so that you, can, you who are watching can tell who, who, who's speaking about what. They've been introduced, so let's start Let's start by just a, a, a tour around the table. What does, what does the new industrial policy mean around the world? And we'll go chron chronologically. We could say China, the US, the EU, Africa, India, Latin America. Um, let's, um, so uh, Mark, can you start off? Oh. 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I just want to extend my thanks as well uh, to SEAL and to uh, the co-organizers of this conference. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. So the new industrial policy is in many respects a response to China's industrial policy over the better part of the last quarter century. Um, when we talk about industrial policy in China, it's not the same conception as we think of industrial policy in the rest of the world. Industrial policy in the rest of the world, you think about the state, meaning either the executive branch or the legislature appropriating a certain amount of sums with transparent objectives and transparent goals. Uh, when you talk about the Chinese context, it's an entirely different enterprise where it's a national development strategy. Now, I know many of your countries also have development strategies, but here it's one where the entire resources of the state are blurred with that of the party in service of these objectives. Now, it's not one where there's no role for the private sector. Any of you who've been to China can see the private sector is quite vibrant. There's a lot of competition and so forth, but it is one where the party state controls what they call the commanding heights of the economy to allocate capital, to allocate resources in order to service this development strategy, which is to move up the value chain and to attain greater economic autarky when it comes to technology in particular. So in response to that, you've seen Industrialized countries, particularly in the West, lose out on certain emergent technologies, lose jobs, and so forth. And because one side is playing with a whole set of tools, and the other side now feels it need to equip itself. And so, I, Amy, just in short order, that's what I think gives rise to the tensions behind the new geopolitics and the new industrial policy. Just to fill in a little bit about the U.S., what, the, what has happened in the U.S., the new industrial policy, there's actually a long tradition in the U.S. of defense industrial policy. The Department of Defense has been the only area of government that had an ongoing industrial policy really since the 1950s. And, but you know, before the pandemic, though, there was, other than defense, a policy paradigm in which the government was not a direct player in industry. But again, starting in the pandemic, uh, the government, the U.S. government used the Defense Production Act of 1950, 1950 to compel private firms to prioritize and deliver inputs for vaccine manufacturing. They spent a lot on, on uh, personal protective equipment, vaccines and medicines. They interfered with trade using the DPA. Um, and th so there's a, there, now there's a shift by the Biden administration to clean energy and to semiconductors. And this is really an adjustment in direction, but not a fundamental change. What's happening now is basically the big, the new developments in the last two years are massive spending under three industrial policy laws, kind of a blend of the old and new. The, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the big infrastructure bill, it's $1.2 trillion, um, largely for you know, roads and bridges and other construction, but this is tied to uh, domestic content requirements, Buy America requirements for iron, steel, and construction materials. So that's an, an old industrial policy that's been way expanded in the last two years. Then there was the CHIPS Act. There's $55 billion, including $39 billion for in grants for onshoring chip production and $24 billion, another $24 billion for tax credits for semiconductor um, production. So there's a new industrial policy that's connected to a desire to diversify existing supply chains in light of, let's say, the defense applications of semiconductors and tensions in East Asia. But you know, again, this is tied to new and old industrial policies. There are requirements on these grants for workforce development programs. Uh, the construction uh, will be of these semiconductor plants will be covered by, it'll be subject to Buy America requirements. There are union wage requirements for construction. It's, you know, interesting. So next, the tax credits. The third thing, the third item was the so-called Inflation Reduction Act passed last year, targeted tax credits, many of them with no spending cap on the total amount spent. They could add up to $780 billion. That is much larger than the CHIPS Act. 
Um, so you, you've all heard about the IRA tax credits for consumers of electric vehicles that are limited to vehicles that are finally assembled in North America. They're tied to local content or free trade area content in battery minerals and battery components. Um, uh, these, these tax credits will soon not be available for any vehicle that has Chinese content in the battery. Um, and so, so that's kind of, and, but again, don't, uh, don't underestimate the effect of these tax credits in other areas like solar. Uh, tax credits will pay for up to 70% of the cost, the capital cost for new small solar and wind construction, uh, up to 50% of the capital cost for utility scale solar. There's huge, there is going to be huge, um, uh, you know, there is already a, a great uh, upsurge in, in construction of factories in the United States powered by tax credits and other spending. We'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, so I'll just focus on the European Union. I think in Europe, we're seeing that industrial policy is making a bit of a comeback. For a long time, of course, the European Union was focused on the internal market, strengthening, expanding the internal market and, ex and accessions to the European Union. We also see that it was very much competition driven and focusing on the economic and monetary policy of the European Union. To be sure, in the past, there were some attempts to create like what we call industrial champions in Europe. Airbus is probably the most uh, visible example. Uh, but industrial policy was not really something that was actively pursued by the European Union until I would say 2014, when the first communication started to come out from Brussels. And it was already happening before the pandemic, in fact, this movement to industrial policy. We saw it with, in 2019 with the EU Green Deal. Then in the next year, in 2020, we had the digital transformation communication. And then finally, in 2021, we had this industrial policy communication of uh, the Commission. And then that was updated again uh, in 2023 with the Green Deal Industrial Plan. And it's very much an industrial policy in the name of basically three objectives, I would say. Uh, the digital transition, the green transition, and also in the name of security. And when we talk these days about security, we need to make a distinction between national security and this concept of economic security. And I know that we'll have several panels during the next uh, few days that will focus on that discussion. Now, the European Union says that it can pursue this industrial policy fully in support of the multilateral trading system and in a way that is consistent with the multilateral system. That's a bit of a, a different approach maybe from what we hear in Washington. But I think we need to be clear that a lot of the voices coming out of Washington, you can hear them in Brussels also, including uh, when talking to members of the European Parliament, uh, you see that uh, they more think alike the US on some of these issues in terms of maybe we, do, we have to focus less on the multilateral framework and the restrictions that that imposes on how we pursue industrial policy. Now, one of the difficulties, of course, for the European Union is that in Europe, when it comes to subsidies, it's the member states that subsidize. It's not the European Union primarily that subsidizes. The Green Deal Industrial Plan is, is starting to change that a little bit with the idea that there's more funds concentrated at EU level uh, and that it's the European Union granting those funds. But the result is very much that Maybe in Europe, we can't speak about one industrial policy, but we have various industrial policies where you see that the EU is coming out with, for example, a communication on economic security, but maybe a few weeks later, Germany also has its own strategy. So that is some of the limitations I think that we see in the European Union, because we have competences that need to be respected, uh, including in terms of who gives the money um, and who has the particular competence to act. So the European Union has a few limitations in its pursuit of an industrial policy, uh, because of its specific features and its relations with um, the, the member states. Um, I think, Amy, you also mentioned the issue of defense as being an essential part of US industrial policy. That's again an area, of course, in the European Union has some limitations there because it's a member state competence. But as a result of the war in Ukraine, again, things are changing and there's certain more powers kind of being moved to the EU level. So it's a very dynamic process. 
that's, I think, influenced by the external interests of the European Union, but also by a lot of important internal changes happening within the European Union. And there's some concern that because of this more external approach of the Commission in pursuing industrial policy, that is also changing the European Union from the inside. And I'll stop here. Good. Um, good morning, everyone, and also my thanks to TCL for inviting me. Um, industrial policy, of course, is not new to African countries. Uh, as developing countries, and as you've heard, is one of the tools that developing countries um, use. Although, of course, these tools have been disciplined in the context of the of the WTO. But I think in this new conjuncture, um, Africa finds itself in a contradictory situation. On the one hand, um, it accounts for only about 3% uh, of global output, about 2.4% of global trade. Um, uh, you know, so which means of course that uh, African countries find themselves in a weak position. But on the other hand, um, the African countries uh, 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 among the 10 fastest growing economies in, in the world, they also account right now for 1.2 uh, billion of the world's population that would double by 2050 to about um, uh, to, to about 2.4 uh, billion, uh, which would mean that uh, one in every four people working on the planet will be Africans. Uh, so I, I mentioned this to just uh, contextualize that um, this contradictory situation that the African countries find themselves in, in on the one hand, uh, weakness, um, not being the drivers of all these changes that are happening globally, but on the other hand, looking to the future, uh, that Africa would be playing an important uh, role. So what the African countries uh, seem to be doing uh, in this conjuncture is um, to refocus the attention on the WTO. To go back to say um, the EU to some extent, as we've just heard, is um, uh, taking that line as well, uh, like the US. What the African countries are saying that um, yes, we are now seeing uh, these new policies uh, that are driving a, a truck through, literally, through WTO uh, uh, rules and, and laws, uh, and that um, the, the action should come back to the WTO to look to see how um, the WTO could rebalance itself in the face of these uh, new uh, developments. So we have seen three important initiatives come from the African countries um, recently uh, in, in the last few months. The first was a communication to the WTO that came out on the 1st of March. The title speaks for itself. The title of this communication was Policy Space for Industrial Development, a case for, rebal a case for rebalancing trade rules to promote industrialization and to address emerging challenges such as climate, co concentration of production, and digital industrialization. So this communication uh, the, of the African group came out, uh, as I said, on the 1st of March. The second communication, uh, which did uh, aim to de de dive deeper into one of the key areas of WTO law, was a case uh, for rebalancing the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures that came out on the 26th of, of the 26th of May. And then the third communication we just came out last week, the title is The Role of Technology uh, Transfer in Resilience Building, the TIPS Agreement. So you will see from just the title of these three communications that what the African countries are aiming to do now is to take the action back to the WTO to say that things have fallen apart but we need to come back to look to see under the multilateral framework, how we could pull things together again in a way that makes sense for the rest of the world, for all of us uh, on the planet, but also for these uh, African countries that do recognize that they're uh, at a lower level of development and wanting to grow their economies. Uh, so I think this is the, the approach the Africans are taking. And I'll just end with three quick points on this. The first is that um, the African countries also say that um, WTO rules should take into account share of world trade, share of um, uh, market penetration, and um, uh, also 
the third one the, the, the emphasizing is um, uh, the share of uh, or how quickly countries have been able to diversify their economies. Uh, this is deliberate because they do understand that um, since countries self-define who they are, the WTO, you do have developing countries like China, for example, that define themselves as a developing country. But um, the African countries are, are now trying to differentiate um, between their needs and uh, those that have traditionally defined themselves as developing countries and the WTO. And the second aspect to, to all of this is that um, they're looking for coherence. Um, you know, they're looking for coherence because as I've said, uh, the things are falling apart and um, we now need to uh, look to see how to pull things together again in, in a meaningful way. And the third aspect is that um, the African countries are pointing out that a number of WTO provisions are now totally out of date. Uh, if you take the agreement on uh, subsidies and countervailing measures, some of the um, uh, provisions uh, that had flexibilities for developing countries had expired uh, in 1999, 2000, and 2002. Do I have time to get into the details? So basically, in a nutshell, African countries recognizing that they are the future, recognizing their weakness, uh, this current conjuncture, but wanting the action to return to the WTO if we are to have coherence in how we approach these issues. Thank you. Uh, James. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me for this uh, uh, wonderful conference, which is happening physically after four years. So really excited to be here. So when we think about the industrial policy of India, I do not think that we have got a new industrial policy. India has a very old industrial policy, which somehow got diluted a little bit in the 1990s, but the industrial policy of India remains substantially the same. And I feel that the industrial policy of many countries actually remains substantially the same. Because in a country like India, when you have got 1.4 billion people, and when the private investment in most of the sectors is actually very limited, the government cannot actually stay back. Sometimes the government will have to make an investment in some of the critical sectors, in some of the capital intensive sectors to make sure that there are enough jobs created in the country. And also given the fact that India is extremely dependent upon, on, uh, on, on fuel and energy resources from other countries, from a balance of payment issue as well, India needs exports. So if you really look at India's policy over a period of time, uh, you know, I think I just would like to I mean, recall the statement of uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India. So he said that India needs, in, you know, gone are the times where India has to invest in companies that actually make hair oil and other things. We have to invest in companies that produce the hard capital goods. So that is where India invested in steel sector, in aluminum sector, a number of industries for that matter. So, at that time, the, the capital mobilization of the company was in the country was very limited, and the government involvement was actually a necessity. But the second point is that because of balance of pay, payment reason, the country became extremely inward looking. There is actually a statement about India that the rate of growth in India is actually a Hindu rate of growth. What is actually the role of Hindu rate of growth? Whatever you do in the country, nothing really changes. So that the rate of India should be written in scriptures the, because nobody can actually change it. So the fact is that for a country like India, uh, you know, competing with many countries, especially with this uh, Southeast Asian countries, China for the matter, it is extremely tough. And when you have to have a certain kind of, uh, certain kind of a goal in terms of your export target, sometimes the government will have to provide export subsidies. And the country can, uh, in, I mean, doesn't have the money to also provide significant amount of subsidies. So they have targeted certain kind of industries where subsidy and government support can be provided. So over a period of time, this particular policy where the government has as a commanding heights uh, did not yield any good. The country went into a deep, uh, I think, balance of payment crisis in the 1990s, then it opened up. So what actually happened? India completely liberalized its uh, import licensing policy. India liberalized its industry licensing policy. The major difference is that at the moment, there's no industrial licensing for establishing new investment. So in the sense that foreign companies are extremely welcome in the country to make an investment. In the past, there was actually even allocation of investment within various parts of the country. So that kind of an import license has actually gone in the country. 
But again, you know, there's a new policy called the Atman Nirbha Bharat policy. What is actually Atman Nirbha? Atman Nirbha basically means self-reliance. So uh, self-reliance in the sense that India would like to, uh, to attract investment from other parts of the world pro by providing subsidies. So one, I think, negative side is that whenever a particular unit of a product goes out of the factory, there is actually government support attached to it. So uh, to that extent, it is nothing but a subsidy policy. And like in many other countries, India also provides some kind of import substitution requirement as well. So let me tell you, this is again not a new policy. If you really looked at India's, some of the India's old WTO cases, the India auto case or the India QR case for that matter, obviously there was an import domestic content requirement in that. That policy did not change. Even in 2012, India has got a case called the Swalov case. What was it actually? It was a government trying to provide a support for encouraging investment in the renewable energy sector. But at the same time, they tied that particular thing to the use of domestic contents. So these kind of policies are not actually changing anywhere in the world. Now, to come back to the point, if at all I have to say that there is some kind of a revision to the new policy that actually happened in the COVID time. During the COVID time, there was a major jolt with respect to the availability of inputs and raw materials. And not only India, many other countries actually wanted to have this kind of facilities within the country. So it was actually a, a crisis and many countries uh, did not want to rely upon imports for variety of reasons, not only because of COVID reasons, the logistic cost, geosecurity related issues. So most of the countries actually wanted to have that kind of capacity, which, which is homegrown. And so to, to, to make a general statement, I don't think that the policies have actually changed. There have been some revisions, some minor modifications in the policy. But most of the countries would like to encourage domestic investment. They would like to give support. And most of the countries would also like to provide some kind of a domestic content requirement. That has happened in multiple countries. So in fact, I have written a paper in the context of the WTO dispute settlement going, uh, you know, getting into this kind of a covert situation, there is a tendency for every country to use import substitution measure. And there is actually a rise of import substitution measure in every country. So to that extent, I would say that India's policies mm -hmm. hasn't changed. The last. Okay. Uh, about industrial policy. It's easy for me. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and see people. Uh, about industrial uh, policy. For me, it's easy. I'm an economist. I teach the all, uh, industrial and trade policy for all my life. So it's nice to see how this came and go with the different models. I start my life work with the prep school, that is a lot of the state intervention, a lot of subsidies, a lot of high tariff. Then I move the, the Uruguay around and everything changed. And then you go to a, what's globalization, which was now the, all the, 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 the outsourcing and so on. Now for me, industrial policy is there is not, not, not such a thing as industrial policy. What we have now with job uh, politics, what we have now with job economics, the driven force behind industrial policy now is the rearming, is the fight of uh, China and United States that is changing completely the scenario. And now as the consequence, now in the last government of Brazil, we are very liber liberalized everything. Now in the, the new government, we are talking about state-owned enterprise again, a lot of subsidies, industry ask for more tariff protection. So it's a completely change. Look of the numbers behind the, the, the percentage of GDP that European countries are putting in the army sector. So it's a new industrial policy, it's, it's the, army, uh, the army security issues that is put on the side. And now to talk a, a, a different point, about geopolitics. What is driven the, the industry in, uh, in, in Brazil and South America? Do you Europeans and Americans, I take paying attention that the new kid in the block is China. Do you think that Latin America is uh, under the protection of the Marshall Plan of the United States? Forget about it. If you go to see the numbers of Brazil, export and imports, Brazil is exporting to China. Brazil is a big power, and we are talking about food production. Nobody, who is taking really worry about industry? In the, the, the middle of the war, and you have all the land of uh, Ukraine destroyed by mining and also, who is going to provide food for the rest of the world? 
that's the real point. And the industry behind to protect this, to, to, to help this. So the new industrial policy is driven also by, uh, by food, food production, right? And the next point, and let's go again to China. What China is doing is exactly to take in the space of multi European and American multinationals that are producing for Latin America, who is providing, is exporting uh, capital goods, electrical goods, and all the industrial products to South America is China. It's not more European Union and United States. Pay attention of this. It's amazing the numbers, how they are growing, uh, the, the China involvement in South America. And no, it's not, uh, certainly China is not worried about the market only. Is it interested in other things? And let me uh, change towards the, another big point behind industrial policy is mining. Look you, the Greens, the young Greens fanatics, right? The, 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 they are fighting for. Are you sure that you are going to have you, Europe? Sorry. If you have, uh, do you think that they are going to have the, all cars in Germany moved by electric cars? Forget about it. I'm an economist. I love numbers. Put the numbers on the table. There is no enough minerals to provide all the, the batteries. Do you know how many tons of metals do you need in a car? 2,000. How about a nice tower of eolic? 100,000, 100 tons of minerals, the metals. And again, where is these new metals? They are around, not in, uh, as I said, under Notre Dame de Paris, not in, in, uh, in Germany. They are in South America and Africa. Where? Under the forest, that's it, in the, in the desert of, uh, of uh, uh, Latin America. So, and, to, to, and what China is doing is refining these minerals and using a lot of energy and polluting a lot. Take a look what's going on in Indonesia with nickel. Come on, they destroyed the forest already and they're going to dig now in the ocean, you greens. I take pay attention to this. They are going to destroy the ocean because they are taking the minerals and throw the residuals. Another nice number. Do you know the amount of, uh, when you get a, a mining, how much you really tra being transformed in the rare earth? 20% or less. The rest is going to pollute. So pay attention, you greens, what, what we are doing, defending uh, that uh, the new industrial policy will be green and uh, it will be uh, the digital and so on. Do you have an idea how much of energy a computer, a nice huge uh, fabric of uh, uh, the, the, the computer stores, the high, like the, the, the big ones that are the chains of producing it? Take a look at the numbers, again, all the numbers. And the nice thing that I have to do is, uh, how many how many suits you buy per year? How many suits? I mean, how you how you are, you are change your your clothes? Take a look now in the Atacama Desert in Chile, China. Do you know what's going on there? It's the huge mountains, huge mountains of textile. And do you think old textile? No new textile that are out of fashion in Europe, in the United States, and they're being thrown down in the desert of Atacama in China. This is immoral, right? And uh, when you start talking about new industrial, you must be clean. Come on, uh, you must be using uh, electrical cars. You are not getting the numbers right. If you go to see this and you are going to see that you are not doing, you are sell, selling an illusion. So back to Brazil, South America, the new things that's going on is the, 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 the concentration more in industry related to, to, uh, to agriculture, industry related to mining, the refining and how we are going to see uh, the, the, the difference. And now to Europe again, it's impossible to, 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 to agree on a series of, uh, of regulation. Europe is a kind of imperialist regulator now. Uh, uh, it's impossible. Look, look at the global number of seven. What's going on? First scope one, two, and three. Come on, if you don't go to the source of energy, you're selling illusion also, Isabel. So what is that going to do? You have to say where this came from. Energy in Brazil is clean. 
uh, half, half percent of energy, electrical energy, 90% is from water. So again, and how about Germany? Where you're going to electrify your cars, from where? For what kind of energy you are going to use? So the, the, to talk about industrial, you have to talk about energy sources and minerals and, uh, and food production. And that is more or less the new, the, the new thing that's behind, behind the, the old industrial policy. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, it's good. So, the last point. Come on, I'm so happy that I have James here. Do you know another thing that's new in the block, in the old, the old, old world, is what's going on in G20. Pay attention. For the first time, G7 is fighting with the G20, where you have half and half developed and developing countries. And there's a fun, new thing, and a new amalgam that is India, Indonesia, India, Brazil, and South Africa, playing, uh, uh, trying to do a different things. And this is the big point. We are not going to accept anymore the kind of regulation imposed by the North. So global North and regulation, the parallelism of regulations, mainly of, from Europe, and then we are going to try to do, and I'm going to talk about standards and so on. We, the global south, you are trying to do a different uh, proposal. It's amazing how India and Brazil is trying to do uh, as a new dialogue between the two countries and to see what we can do together. Pay attention, G20. Next. Well, I think we have Ryan, a time for another round before 11 o'clock. So our, our second round will be on We've, we've obviously we've already surfaced uh, some points of conflict. Um, we've talked about what industrial policy is, what's going on, what the new industrial policy is, what the old industrial policy is, and the remarkable continuity of the old industrial policy in the new one. So, you know, the question is like where, if you think about the conflicts, there are obviously there's been big conflict between the EU and the US about the location of, of investment in new technologies and the subsidies that might affect the location of this, of say battery plants. Um, there have been, there's been conflict over domestic content measures. There's been contract uh, conflict over subsidies, uh, standards, sorry, environmental standards like uh, deforestation, the deforestation rules in the EU. And so, and standards wars between the US and the EU and China. Uh, and so uh, we'll have another round in the same order uh, about, and oh, oh, okay, another issue. We have, of course, the really interesting issue of uh, the idea of having a minerals club that has been floated by the US. The US, uh, uh, say, Jennifer Harris, who's connected to the Biden administration, has floated the idea of having a, a critical minerals club, uh, which would be like a, a traded investment agreement where the minerals, the, the, the countries that produce the minerals would agree to uh, not expropriate, and there would be preferential tariffs and regulatory measures for minerals from certain places, from those places. And there would be, it actually reminds me very much of the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, so there's all, there's all that, okay? And then you, then you have the WTO. So, you know, where's the, so is, what's, what's, what role does the WTO have? I mean, what, are, what is the WTO? Are they just chopped liver? Um, how, how, can they, how can they keep their relevance in the global economic system that's a global economic system that's increasingly based on, you know, domestic content requirements, uh, by local requirements, subsidies, you know, how can, how can they provide value to their members and also mediate these conflicts? Where, are the, where is the WTO gonna be on this issue 10 years from now, 20 years from now? So Mark, you start. Okay, so I'm going to be the pessimist, but I think I've been the pessimist for the better part of the last decade. When I started being the pessimist, 
many of you said, oh, no, 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 you know, you, I, for those of you who are, I see some graduate students, I see some young junior professors, right, a lot of people said, no, you just need a little bit more time, understand this more, so on and so forth, so for those of you who fall into that category, right, stick with your, uh, what you believe in, okay, uh, uh, but let me make the point, I'll come to answer your question, but let me make the point this way, right, um, what we heard from this panel, notice what I described China, how James described India, two very different, you cannot think of more different political governance systems, but essentially the words sounded very similar, right? 1.4 billion people need government intervention in order to think about jobs, need some degree of self-reliance and so on and so forth, right? These two countries historically have accounted for at least 30% of the global economy. They're nowhere close to that level. And they believe that this industrial policy, which is not a new industrial policy, just a traditional industrial policy, is the way they should manage their political economy, right? So that's what we're seeing against. Now, let me ask a question of all of you, because we have gathered here some of the world's leading experts in international law. How many of you know who He Lifeng is, or could even say three sentences about He Lifeng? He Lifeng. Okay, I see one hand, right? Professor Henry Gao, for those of you watching online. Okay, this man, right? And I say this just to show how much people don't understand what is happening in China with the industrial policy. This is the person who has run China's development strategy, the planning commission under Xi Jinping. He is good, close personal friends with Xi Jinping and is China's new economic czar. Now, the fact that Right, we are here with some of the world's leading experts, and most of you do not even know right, who China's economic czar is. Just goes to show right, how much one does not understand the nature of economic industrial policymaking that's going on in China. Now, let me toss out one other statistic for you. Right? It's no open secret right, that China has viewed green technologies as essential, not only for creating new jobs, but this is where the economy is going, but also for its own energy security, right? They've been doing this for the better part of, as I suggested in my opening comments, a quarter century, right? The planners have stuck very persistently to this. Um, as Vera and David and others have mentioned, right? They've um, had their firms uh, size up deals in critical minerals all around the world, and they now have a monopoly on this, right? And so, um, 10 years ago, I wrote an article that talked about right, uh, the rare earths, raw materials, right, and so forth, and the inability of WTO rules to discipline right, this type of arrangements, even though it's clearly illegal under WTO rules. Right? And so we've seen these cases, and some of you were skeptical about it, but you know, did you, if you paid attention to the news last week, right, again, the restrictions are in place, and critical minerals, it's like the Britney Spears song, oops, I did it again, right? Uh, but it just goes to show, right, that the system here with the existing rules is not able to discipline the largest players. And then when you look at the industrial policy just in the renewable energy space, right, China's commitment on subsidies here is larger than the G7 combined. So, you know, what we have here in the conflict is, right, one side that has WTO rules are unable to discipline it. A set of global South countries that do not want to discipline China because right, they don't want to necessarily tie their own hands uh, and so forth. And then you've got the US, EU and the rest of G7 saying, well, if we keep our own hands tied behind our backs, we're going to continue to lose out as we have been in these renewable energy sectors and we're not gonna be able to manage our energy transition. So that in essence, Amy, right, is why I remain pessimistic about the conflict because this is kind of an intractable knot. How are you going to unwind this? How are you going to tie this? And for those of you who are skeptical about it, right, or who are a little bit more optimist, present me with a plan why the WTO or the MPIA or the, right, and so forth, right, is going to deal with this new set of export restrictions that just came out that were announced last week much more effectively and to sort of highlight all this, right? So that's a, sort of a short answer here as to Gordian not that I see. I think, right, the industrial policy here is very opaque from the largest, largest trading power, second largest economy in the world, leading right supplier of critical minerals, energy transition being absolutely critical for much of the rest of the world, and the global south here not wanting to get on board with multilateralism to discipline instead of rules here presents sort of a knot that cannot be untied. Uh, let, me, uh, let me pass it to Isabel and just, you know, certainly that was a direct challenge by China to, it was particularly, it was noted that 
uh, what they restricted, what China restricted was gallium and germanium. So, uh, but to have France and Germany uh, target it was interesting. Just, so back to, back to you, Isabel. Thank you, Amy. Um, I share some of that skepticism, especially because it seems that when we talk about trade these days, everything is discussed through a security paradigm, whether it's national security or economic security. And we know where that leaves us in terms of WTO rules. Um, and that's an evolution, I think, from when the export restrictions on rare earths, raw materials were initially considered by the WTO. That was very much still through an environmental prism. And the fact of the matter is that the reason why the EU now um, kind of focuses on resilience is like the new buzzword. We need to ensure that we, we are not too dependent in terms of our supply. I think with raw materials, to be honest, it's a bit of a problem of the EU's own making. For a long time, the EU was very happy not to use its own reserves, not to start open mines. And the, the EU preferred to buy, and I guess the United States also, to buy these materials uh, cheaper from China, and uh, they preferred not to use their own reserves. Um, and now, of course, they've realized that you can take those issues to the WTO, but that doesn't mean that China will actually uh, share its resources uh, with the EU and uh, the United States and other countries. And now we're short of time because the EU has this targets by 2030. And while um, it is true, of course, for the raw materials that there are particular reserves that are very much concentrated in specific countries, there are actually a lot of these raw materials also in Europe, but mines need to be opened, licenses need to be given. Uh, the European Union wants this to be done according to the strictest environmental standards, and it's just not possible to do this uh, by 2030. So that's the big discussion you hear also in Brussels right now, is will the EU have to lower some of its environmental standards to meet some of these other objectives um, in terms of um, providing the electric cards, uh, etc. But I, I say historically, it's, it's a bit of, the, the EU has some blame here, and I remember when there was a case, the first few cases involving export restrictions on raw materials from China, that some of the arguments were, that were being presented were that China, by acceding to the WTO, had agreed to share its raw materials with the EU and, and the United States, uh, which is, of course, is, is, is not a proposition that is easy to, to accept. And in terms of then the role of the WTO, it seems these days we... Everyone takes a transactional approach to trade issues with short-term solutions. And these days we don't talk about agreements anymore. We talk about clubs, partnerships, but at the end of the day, they're about preferences and how the WTO can accommodate such preferences under the existing rules. And also the second development that we have to think about how it can the WTO be relevant is that we use non-binding instruments to regulate trade these days and to see cooperation between certain trading partners, whether it's G7, G20, or, or other countries. And it's very difficult to see how the WTO kind of can assess or accommodate these types of non-binding instruments for regulating trade. And, and here I draw a, a parallelism with some of the ways in which the EU is um, moving forward with its uh, implementing its industrial policy, because the EU doesn't always work with strict requirements, they work with targets, especially in the area of environmental climate change measures. So how do you assess a target uh, under WTO rules? We have very little guidance on that in, in the case book. So there's a lot of new questions that need to be resolved. And I, I'm not quite sure how with all of these preferences being embedded in these clubs and partnerships, um, how the, the WTO can, um, can control um, those various corporations. Very good. I mean, because I think as you pointed out, there are actually key in issues like the fact that mining is actually very, can be a, a, di a disruptive and dirty process and that uh, developed countries have prefer preferred not to have mining on shore. While the, while the, while the US, while the US is, has, is spending huge amounts of money, there hasn't really been a meaningful attempt to grapple with the permitting process and with also sh labor shortages, both of which can really short Get, can really be bottlenecks for 
the industrial development they're targeting. Uh, David. Yeah. Um, I think three points I'd like to make at this stage. Firstly, uh, these policies that are emerging among the global majors should do no harm. And here I'll uh, turn to Isabel and say that uh, we've done some work on the CBAP, uh, the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism as an economist, we did some modeling and um, the modeling results speak for themselves uh, that um, uh, this uh, law will impact Africa negatively, uh, including uh, the perverse uh, uh, flow of uh, revenues from Africa to the EU. Um, which you know, surely there's a moral question uh, over that. So um, I think that's one point that um, you should do no up, especially to the weakest, uh, to the poorest uh, in the global economy. Second point is that um, uh, uh, I'm a skeptic of um, the extent to which uh, green minerals are going to be needed for clean technologies in the future. I've seen some work that is being done, um, several universities across the UK, that many of these clean technologies are going to use less uh, of these uh, minerals uh, as we see them today than in the future. And that is why um, you know, I say to my uh, African uh, uh, friends in policy making that really they should be focusing, as you have said, uh, James, India did, in um, uh, basic, uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, components for uh, sustainable industrial uh, de development and, and growth, and not just to focus on these uh, uh, these passing uh, uh, fads. The third point brings us back to the role of the WTO, which I focus on my main uh, points and the first in intervention. You know, clearly also the weakest uh, do need the multilateral system to provide this coherence. I fully agree that. Um, Many of these issues uh, that are emerging and the way that preferences are being embedded in, in various um, uh, configurations and so on do pose a problem. But um, I think um, that we do need to continue to work towards looking into how the WTO could be relevant in this situation. And I pointed out the initiatives that the African group is already taking. The conversations are going on. The MC13 is coming up in Abu Dhabi uh, next February. And uh, the African group, uh, unlike in the past, uh, which has been a bystander in many of these uh, WTO negotiations, is taking uh, uh, a lead this time to say that these issues need to be on the table. We need to be addressing them. We need to look to see how the key legal instruments in the WTO need to be reformed for this new situation. Uh, thank you. And, but uh, just to comment that uh, the environment that I see in Washington is one where um, of less and less patience with the idea that in the WTO, the developed countries have to maintain the rules and then the developing countries get, uh, get exceptions. The, re the reaction in Washington to a demand for exceptions by developing countries is likely to be, we want that too. So if developing countries want exceptions for, for domestic content requirements, you will see that in the United, demand for that in the United States. You've seen that in the United States, political demand, and there's more money behind it. There's just much more money behind it well, who's getting in, the, in the, the United States. The exceptions, the exceptions now is uh, with the developed countries, not with the developing uh, countries, uh, which is why, you know, we're looking to see how to, to, to reform the system. These are the these developed countries that are getting the exceptions these days. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I would like to talk about two issues which came up in this discussion. One is basically the club formation. So we know that any kind of a club is basically antithetical to the concept of an open trade. So we have got now this kind of critical minerals club. Many countries are actually entering into agreements, cooperation agreement with respect to extraction and development of critical minerals. And we also have what we call as a climate clubs. When we really look at these kind of clubs, they're deeply, I think, discriminatory. So let us actually I mean, let us look at why these countries are doing it. Their argument is that we really want to have resilient supply chain. We really want to actually respond to this kind of pand pandemic kind of a situation. We don't want to the same kind of situation to happen. But the problem is that when we have that kind of a club situation, the investment will only flow within the club. And the technology transfer will only flow within that particular club. So let us actually look at even the, you know, the, the climate club for that matter. One country or a set of countries actually believe that 
this is the way we should you know transition to the green economy and any country that is actually doing a business along the same ways that we do will be given some kind of a, a recognition we can actually take the goods from there without any kind of a penalty but if they are not doing the way that we are doing then we, they will be subject to some kind of a retaliatory duty the problem is that we are actually creating clubs which will basically destroy this open trading system and will make sure that the technology is not basically flowing along i mean to all the countries which are in dire need of it one point which i mean mentioned let us actually look at a, you know one particular issue from a climate point of view not from a climate point of view but maybe from a subsidy point of view there is an argument that if you are actually giving subsidy for investment in innovative industries for transition to the green economy they are all good economies and in industrial policy should support this kind of things and when we really look at the quantum and the amount of these kind of subsidies they are basically staggering if one country is actually giving 1 trillion amount of subsidy or maybe 500 billion amount of subsidy that is actually much higher than the total export share of a country including india india's total export in 2023 was only 400 billion dollars so the problem is that the countries which have the ability the deep purse can provide subsidies and you can say that if you are providing a subsidy in uh, in textiles and clothing and other things that is a very bad thing but we but we have got the let the you know the, the countries with the resource provide subsidy in green energy electric vehicles which will determine their economic growth James, right. We have three minutes left. So I will I will stop you. Thank you. Uh -huh. So next time I will never accept to, to be in a panel if you don't change my name. You'll be A B Vera. Okay, so I'll be the first to talk. Okay, look, uh, 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 raise an important point, and this is for you Europeans and for you Americans and for you students. The basis of a huge discussion that is behind us is about standards. And pay attention, standards is a thing that for all the life, Americans and Europeans are fighting each other. Let me start with the new, the new standards of ESGs. You love ESGs. Come on, do you know how many standards just, just released last, last week? 600 standards related to uh, ESGs. Who is behind this international uh, accounting standardization uh, board and so on? Again, they use the international standard for accounting and auditing. That's completely different from the, the, the American ones. And you ask what, uh, how the developing countries should react to this. Go to the, others, the other point that I love to discuss. It private standards that you Europeans, you love to create this. They do not talk to each other. There are 250 around and ask what kind of standards the uh, developing country should uh, choose. Nobody knows. And let's go to the, this is for you, Maria. Do you know how many trends there are in WHO? Trade related with other measure, notified, I mean, uh, uh, listed by the secretariat, 16,000. 16, do you know the funny thing, Maria? Do you know how many of these the, the countries are, are notifying to WHO? Half. Who is, who is uh, hiding something around? So put attention on this. A standard is the most important thing. This is a new colonialism. You impose a standard on less developing countries like India and Brazil, South Africa, and so on. But these standards are completely do it, created by you, temperate and uh, cold countries, completely out of the reality of the tropical and uh, uh, poor countries. So this is the big fight. This is the big fight you are talking about. And for WHO, is the only place you are, where we can discuss all this. And look to the Carbon Club, but I love steel. Steel for me is the most important example. Guess what happened last week? The, they create, G G7 created, the famous Club Carbon Club that the United States start discussing and so on. At the end, what the, the, the end conclusion of the group that it's impossible to conclude how to measure carbon if you are an American firm or an European firm. What the hell is going on? You are what? What? How can you put order in the, the universe and not use this kind of of things? So let's go back to uh, again, not for rules. Hard laws, professor. Sorry, let's go to the regulation and guidelines. 
please can you the way you measure your carbon emission be more or less relate for the ones i have it so this is the thing that w chomas do just put a little more order and try to put don't know the old kettle around to see the same thing thank you uh, so your argument is that the who still has a viable role but as as a forum a forum yes. where all countries can meet to talk about cbam to talk about measuring carbon to, to talk about the mediating their conflicts over industrial policy so okay we're running over time i want i, I want to ask just to wrap up one sentence from each of you because we're because we're over time one sentence of, that you would say about industrial policy in the 21st century Industrial policy is here to stay, and it's only going to evolve as the fourth industrial revolution and digitization um, brings it into new domains. I would just say that from, uh, in terms of industrial policy, you hope it's developed for the right reasons. And it's not just a question of copycat behavior, because it does seem that that's something that's happening, including in the definition of the EU's industrial policy. Industrial policy is just now gel economics. Look, you have to change your mind, you lawyers and economists. Change your mind. Go to study what gel politics is. And now you are going to understand the word. Thank you. I will only just uh, talk about subsidies in industrial policy. I would only mention that we are all sinners. Now, the rest of the world has actually lost the credibility and the legitimacy to criticize China. So, and that's the only thing I think. As all these policies emerge, my one sentence is, do no harm. So, thank you everyone, and thank you very much. Please thank the speakers. Thank you very much uh, to this fantastic panel. So now we have the break. Uh, we kindly ask you to come back here uh, two minutes before 11.30. So coffee and water is, I'll turn the left, thank you.